Okay, welcome. This is uh, Dr. Morton. This is Micro One, and I'm going to talk about uh, the first written test. Um, not the programming test, but uh, the first written test. And uh, that'll be on Thursday, so uh, this should be appropriate. Uh, I'm, I probably will do a video for Thursday where I talk about the lab for this week. I can't remember what it is, but we'll see it in a second here. All right. Um, okay, I think that's it. So let me uh, let me shrink this down, and we'll talk about the syllabus. So uh, here we are on the 13th, uh, and our Lab 7 is reading, okay, the, reading the chip temp, the external uh, temperature sensor, the MCP9700 on the little analog board, the pot, and the photoresistor. Now, you've already done the photoresistor. I mean, sorry, you've already done the pot. Uh, so we're going to add to it the internal temp, and the and an extra the external temp mounted on the analog board, and then we're going to display that uh, using the UART on a terminal window, so that should work. Um, I know one student had a question about should the uh, should the uh, the CR twenty one hundred two adapter board be smoking? Uh, no, it should not be smoking, and if it is, it's probably because you plugged it in backwards. Uh, unfortunately, I, uh, I I when we passed out the, uh, the CR2102s, uh, this, some of them had, uh, had a right angle header like that, which means they have to be plugged into the board. Now, here's the deal. If you have the, if you have the, the standard header, which, uh, which is what I intended to have on all of them, but unfortunately I didn't get that done. Uh, let's see, where is that? So the standard header looks like I'll show you that here I'll flip this camera oh. all right we'll switch this real quick here let me just make this bigger uh, we'll expand this and we'll switch this okay so here are the two you can see one has the pins coming straight out and the other has the pins coming out at a right angle now what happens is, and I've done this before, this isn't the first time, if you plug this one in, there's a little, there's a little diagram here, and it gives, it, it, oh, I'll do it this way, so it's right side up. You can see it's labeled 3.3 volts DTR, uh, pick, transmit, or pick, receive, pick, transmit, ground, and 5 volts. So if you plug it in like this, everything winds up, and it's really hard, I mean, most people would not think to plug it in backwards because it, you know, kind of goes and blocks some of the other stuff. And everybody can kind of see how it just naturally lines up and gets plugged in. Yeah. I see we got a bent pin. Oh, that's my problem. Okay, so that makes sense, right? It just sits right like that right over the top of this panel and everything lines up perfectly. All right, but unfortunately, if you got this header and you plug it in like this, you're gonna blow it. Don't do that. Look at it. Notice it says five volts there, it says three volts there. So you have to plug it in this way to make all the pins line up. You have to plug it in with the, the chip facing the microchip and the back of the board facing out this way. So if you folded it down, all those things would line up. So try and keep that in mind uh, and try not to plug it in backwards. It's real easy to do, but all you gotta do is look and read what the things say. And I think I mentioned that in, in some of the literature. All right, anyway, so try not to burn any more of those out. There, you know, they're three or four bucks, but no reason to deposit that down the drain. Okay, now, uh, so so this Friday we will be doing, we will be using the analog boards, we'll be using the UARTs, and uh, we'll be reading a whole bunch of analog signals. And we'll, you'll see how we can multiplex uh, those signals and read them in, in lab. So that's, uh, sorry, down here at lab seven. And then uh, next week we'll do the sleep lab and the watchdog timer lab. So that should be interesting. And then, uh, then we'll hopefully, and then I may switch the order of these. 
I'll probably switch the order of these and we'll do the 2 by 16 LCD uh, for lab 9 and the BJT for lab 10 or we may not get that done. And then we probably will not do the KL25Z labs. I'll leave those to you. If you want to if you want to buy a KL25Z and do them, fine. Um, you can. But uh, I'm, I'm, we're probably not going to cover them in the course because uh, by the time we get uh, down here, uh, we're going to be running out of time. All right. And basically the last lab occurs before Thanksgiving anyway, so... I don't know. We'll see. But I'm, I'm not planning on doing them just because of the hassle of getting the parts to the students. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Let's get rid of this. And uh, so I'm going to review for the test today. That's what I'm going to do. And then uh, we'll I'll have the test all set to go on Thursday, although I haven't made it yet. So I'll need to get that done. All right. Uh, at least I don't think I have. Maybe I maybe I do. I don't know. Anyway, but I don't think so. All right. So here's what I want you to know. And uh, I guess we could look at the website. I think there's I think there's uh, guidance on the on the board. Let me pull that up. Um, not that. Uh, sorry, this one. And we'll log on. And let's see, microcomputers. F20. So if we look down here, we'll see. Uh, so uh, I think there's three files. Practice test one, another test one, and prefer test one written. And that may be all there is. There's another first test practice, which I can't remember. Uh, actually, that one's hidden. Let me see what this one is. Maybe I'll make it available. I don't know how useful that one was. Well, I'll, okay, I'll make it visible. Won't, won't hurt anything. So... And so we'll make it okay. Now it should be available. Okay, yeah. Okay, so there are several of them for you to look at, and if I think if you look at those, you'll be in pretty good shape. Okay, um, so back to the review. All right, so. Um, so we'll talk about the definitions and distinctives of mi microcontrollers, especially as compared to microcomputers. Now you know a microcomputer, like in your desktop and laptop, they have they uh, they uh, those chips don't have really much on them except the cache, the math coprocessor, uh, but all all of the drive circuitry for the buses, for the memory, all the uh, all the address decoding and stuff. Um, a lot of that gets done on the on the motherboard with. Uh, dedicated function chips. Uh, the interface to the mouse, the keyboard, those are all done on the motherboard. Uh, and uh, that that microcomputer chip on your desktop or laptop, your CPU, doesn't have uh, timer modules, doesn't have A to D converters, D to A converters, doesn't have touch sensors, or it doesn't have any of that. Uh, it's basically just there to read in instructions and execute them, read in data and process it. That's all. Um, so we'll talk about the programmer's model here in a minute. The architecture, remember that it is, uh, it is a Harvard architecture chip. It has a separate data memory and a separate program memory. The data memory is 8 bits wide and therefore the data bus is 8 bits wide and the data memory has up to 32 banks of uh, 128 bytes per bank. which gives it basically 12 bits of address. Uh, so that's uh, 4096. And I think that's the maximum memory it can have. The program memory can be up to 32K. It has 15 bits of address. And uh, it has a separate uh, data bus and a separate uh, address bus. And 
typically on all these chips, that program memory is implemented with flash read-only memory uh, so that you can flash your program in and it's going to be non-volatile. Whereas the, the random access memory is static RAM, but when you power it down, whatever's in static RAM disappears. Your, uh, your data memory uh, is, can be accessed uh, using the bank select register, which has five bits of the 12-bit address, and the lower seven bits of the address reside in, in a byte-oriented uh, instruction. Um, are also the bit oriented instructions as well. Uh, so that's that's basically the memory organization. Uh, support requirements. So the requirements to uh, plug in a, uh, a microprocessor chip like in your desktop and laptop uh, are extensive. They require a fairly capable motherboard, motherboard to uh, provide the memory, the boot up ROM, uh, the I.O. bus, uh, the graphics, uh, the graphics card interface, and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, all the USB, all the USB uh, circuitry uh, to make that stuff work. Uh, all the, all the clocks, a uh, whole bunch of stuff. All that's generated off chip on the motherboard, and uh, is provided to the microcomputer. Whereas the microcontroller often has most of that stuff built into it. Um, so extensive support requirements for a micro con microcomputer, minimal uh, support requirements for a microprocessor. Programming. So our microprocess. So typically, we typically we don't program our microcomputer in assembly language, and actually the assembly language for the typical desktop, laptop, uh, Intel, and AMD chips is a very old legacy type uh, assembly language instruction, the IA32 set, uh, which obviously some people have to learn it in order to write compilers and, and uh, to put to do drivers and other things that are often in assembly, but, but most people don't ever have to learn any of that. Uh, we typically just use higher level languages. That's becoming more and more true on microcontrollers uh, as well, because as the memories have gotten bigger, uh, bigger flashes and, and faster processors, we can we can generally uh, uh, use a, a compiler and it works great. Um, so our, our programming though, uh, for our microcontroller, we usually have an integrated development environment where, where we can uh, write the code and then run it. Now, this integrated development environment is almost always hosted on a microcomputer and the, uh, and the actual microcontroller we're programming for uh, it just just gets uh, just gets the information downloaded to it, and then it also is connected by a programmer debugger, where we can also do uh, some debugging. And there's usually some some ex fairly good debug features available to us: uh, source level debugging, watch windows, breakpoints, all sorts of good stuff. Single stepping, run the cursor, and uh, and being able to directly look at any memory location, any program location, and actually. Uh, change the values in the random access memory and in special function registers. Um, so we do have a native instruction set, and we sometimes do program in that, particularly for things that we have real close timing tolerances, we might need to do that. We can also usually uh, program it in several higher level languages. C certainly is one of them that's available and provided free, but there are others that you can get with three third party software, such as BASIC and uh, also, um, uh, there's some other ones out too. Uh, I, mm, I assume, I assume that there is a uh, uh, a Python available, but I actually haven't seen it, so maybe I'm wrong. And then obviously the the MPASM, the assembly language. You also on this chip, we have to set some configuration words to establish some basic functionality, and those are flashed in to the uh, to the to the flash memory the program memory and again the the word size in that flash memory is 14 bits and you should definitely remember that eight bits in our data memory 14 bits in our program memory and then we have a whole bunch of uh, peripheral uh, modules that give us a tremendous amount of peripheral function including general purpose IO ports a B and C uh, and then all sorts of other modules timers a to D converters, D to A converters, um, uh, 
all sorts of places to uh, to uh, 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 to store uh, well uh, all sorts of other functionality like uh, PWM uh, capture and compare. Um, let's see what else. Uh, oh my goodness, uh, there's just a whole host of things. Um, touch sensing module. Um, I don't know, I'm blocking on them for now. Um, certainly, I think I mentioned A to D and D to A conversion and all that. So lots of different peripheral functions. And then finally, uh, we can use our GPIO pins and, and other special modules like the SPI module, the I2C module, and we can interface things like our 2 line by 16 LCD display and, and other devices. So, so we often... Uh, so a microcontroller is basically a small computer on a single integrated circuit. And it usually includes the, the, the CPU, the memory, and a whole bunch of input-output uh, peripherals, or even some just internal peripherals, too, that can be used. Um, we, we, we typically use this uh, as an embedded device. Uh, so typically the user that's using, say, a product made with one of these won't know anything about it, won't, won't necessarily even know it's in there running away. Like, for instance, you drive your car, you don't think about the fact that you probably have 30 microprocessors do, doing their little parts. Some of them are, uh, are controlling the, uh, the spark advance and the electronic ignition. Some of them are monitoring uh, oxygen sensors. Uh, some of them are monitoring tire pressure with remote uh, transmitters in the tires. Some are monitoring how much uh, how hot things are, how much fuel is left in your tank, what the R pressure is. Um, and some of them do things like control the windows, run the, uh, the uh, entertainment uh, uh, radio and uh, CD-ROM player and all that. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of stuff going on. Um, and typically, the user doesn't really know much about them. Uh, it, it's just happening automatically. Contrast that with a microcomputer where you have, uh, it's a more general purpose machine. Usually you uh, get an application you want to use and you, uh, you get it hosted on this microcomputer and it runs. You deal with the application and you don't generally get too wrapped up with the operating system, although sometimes you have to to make things work. Um, all right, so here's our pick. If you look at, uh, I'll move this out of the way. Here was one of our early boards. Uh, this was uh, this came out. Uh, I don't know. It's been a few years. It wasn't our first one. We had one. We had two versions before this: um, the zero version and the Rev One. Um, the Rev One was a lot simpler. Um, the zero version was uh, didn't use a printed circuit board. We just used a little perf board and glued stuff on. Um, anyway, here's what our uh, device looks like. And uh, it's a 20-pin chip. Uh, power and ground are at the top. And you can tell which end is the top because it's got a little teeny notch in it. Uh, you, it's hard to see, but it's right there. You can maybe see a little bitty notch right there. Uh, obviously, this one plugged into a socket. And this one is just mounted straight on the board, soldered in. Um, so... We, we kept the pin count low just to make the board simpler. I think our next, uh, our next generation, I'll probably go to a, to a, uh, a 40 pin chip. So we have some extra pins because we can run out of our pins on this chip. Um, the instruction set, it is an 8 bit processor. We've got 49 instructions, Harvard architecture, 1K of RAM, 8K of flash. Again, that's 14 bit wide. Every one of those 8K locations holds an entire instruction. Um, and let's see. Um, oh, I wanted to point out on this. Notice we had a whole bunch of headers here. We had one for um, we had one for A to D. Uh, uh, I can't read them. I don't remember. Uh, one for our uh, UART. One for our um, uh, analog input. Or that was the A to D. Uh, SPI, I two C, uh, UART, uh, and PWM. So a, PWM, A to D, UART, I squared C, and SPI. Uh, we kind of got rid of these because we didn't really have, uh, we didn't use them all that much. So we kind of dumped them. And now we just have, we have one header for this, uh, this UART, and we have another header 
for our uh, for our plug-in analog board. And then that's really all the headers we have on here, except for uh, the programming header, and then selecting between uh, using the push button as a master clear or a push button input, and then up here we can jump between three volts and five volts power sourcing. And that has more to do with interfacing to other things than it does anything else. And here, here's our programmer uh, debugger, our PicKit 3 plugged in here. Here's our analog board. Here's our CR2102. Okay, um, programmer's model. So, so here, are the, here are the registers I want you to know. There, these are all the registers, but you don't really have to know them. You do have to know these. Program counter low, program counter latch high, status register, BSR, W register. Five registers to know. These, this is what we consider the programmer's model. The registers we're not covering are the, uh, the two indirect registers, F0 and F1, and then they're divided into four registers, uh, file select register 0, low and high, and file select register 1, low and high. So once you get these set, then you can call on them with these indirect references, and it will go out and get those, uh, those bytes and... Uh, and and uh, well, it'll actually it'll it'll actually let you address and get data from from any byte you want to reference uh, through these indirect references. And it, it you can also read program memory with this. These are fully 16-bit registers, and so it gives you a lot of capability. Um, and obviously, the BSR points to the bank when you're not using indirect addressing, which we we really have not used indirect addressing. And then the working register, just the W reg. Okay. All right. Now, oh, stupid thing. Um, okay. Um, okay. And then finally, the status register has uh, has the three bits: clear bit, zero bit, and that half carry bit, for where there's a carry from the low nibble to the upper nibble, which can be used to help you with binary coded decimal mathematics. Uh, okay. So here are the programmer's model again. Remember the W register is eight bits. The BSR only has five bits. The program counter latch high has seven bits, and the program counter latch or the program counter low has eight bits. And then these two file select registers each has eight bits for a total of sixteen. And then the status register is twelve bits, but only the, 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 we're only particularly interested in these three status bits, Z, H, and C. Okay. Um, so you should know that the program counter is 15 bits, and if you want to write it directly, you can. You have to you have to preload the latch with the upper seven bits, and then write the lower eight, and it transfers the latch at the same time as you do that second write, and then that way all 15 bits are updated at the same time, and that's basically keeps you from uh, going off track. Um, and we do have a hardware stack where when we do a, a jump to a subroutine, jump to a function call or jump to a uh, interrupt routine, we, we push the uh, return address onto the stack. It is a 16-bit stack, but there's only, there's only 16 different locations. So we can only do, uh, we can only nest things 16 deep, including uh, our interrupts. Um, so uh, it is a Harvard machine. Uh, the program memory has a word size of 14 bits. The data memory has a word size of 8 bits. OK. Um, Data memory. So it's divided up into 32 banks um, on this chip. And uh, there is 1K of RAM, 8 bits for each location. So 8K bits if you want. And then there's a whole bunch of special function and core registers, which are, are definitely provided and available. Um, and so you have, you can, uh, the program memory is a continue blo continuous block of 8K 14-bit words. Every location can store one complete instruction. There are separate data and program buses uh, so that you can be moving data and program at the same time, although I don't know how you would do that. You usually preload the instruction, and it's a, it's, it has a little bit of a pipeline, so you have a couple of instructions in the pipeline at any given time. 
Uh, we do have interrupts. We do have a hardware stack. We do have indirect addressing. We do have automatic contact savings on interrupt and calls. And we have memory mapped I.O. Okay, now, the, uh, the 32 banks are pointed to by the 5 bits in the BSR. And the core registers of the programmer's model, and they take up the first 20 bytes of, well, the first 12 bytes, really, of uh, every bank. The special function registers are there to control the peripherals. So just note how these... Uh, how these uh, how these ba these each bank is kind of made up. The first 12 bytes are the core registers. The next up to 20 bytes are the special function registers, and then the general purpose RAM starts at 20 hex in each bank. Are at I guess that's at location 32, yeah, and then um, goes all the way up to uh, to 6f hex, and then the the last 16 bytes of RAM are mapped to every bank and they're the the upper 16 in the in bank zero and bank zero then has actually 96 uh common ram locations whereas every other bank uh just has 80 until you get to bank 12 and i think there's 40 in bank 48 in bank 12 something like that and when you add all those up 96 plus 48 plus uh uh um, 11 banks of 80 that turns out to be 1024 locations all right, yeah, you can see it right down there. All right, um, now we have, uh, this was the original circuit that we used, and we glued the parts on and had uh, the students do point-to-point -point soldering. What's really nice is how little care and support these chips take. You just have to give them power. I did use a regulator, but you could just give them battery power as long as you don't get, make, get it over 5.5 volts or drop it much below about 1 point something, 1 point five I think I don't know I can't remember 1.6 so as long as you give it at least 1.6 to 5.5 volts you're good and then all you need is a six pin header and you can program it and then you can have everything else connected however you want you could even have you can once you program it then you can hook the programming pins up to do other functions the only reason that we haven't done that is because we we want to have the ability to use the debug tools if you're going to use the debug tools and you have to keep the programmer debugger connected the whole time and so that's why I generally discourage you from using RA0 and RA1 or the master clear pin not that anybody really is pushing to use that it, but it can be a general purpose input can never be an output but it can be a general purpose input but we're going to keep it as a master clear pin and we're going to keep RA0 and RA1 as uh, part of our uh, programming debugger header okay uh, we do have uh, we do we to this circuit then of course we added uh, headers a push button an RGB LED um, uh, the ability to select between three volts or five volts of, of power and um, and then four touch buttons that we built in and we built in the uh, pull up resistors for a uh, uh, for an I squared C interface and we also uh, put on a socket. For, an, for three analog inputs and for the uh, uh, UART outputs to go through a little uh, uh, UART TTL level to USB converter uh, uh, little CR2102 board. Okay, and I'm not gonna go over the schematic. This is an old one anyway. Um, so uh, the IDE is pretty much free for microchip and uh, we also get the free XC8 uh, the latest generation of ID did not come with MPASM. I don't know if they've corrected that or what the story is on that. So we stepped back to an earlier version so we could use the assembly language. Now that we're using just the XEA compiler, you could use the latest, uh, the latest version of uh, MPLabX if you wanted to. Uh, so um, there is a pretty good user base support for these chips. They've been used for a long, long time. Uh, there have been a few changes in the instruction set to make them more uh, accessible to uh, uh, C programming, but other than that, it's just been a few instructions that have been added. Uh, and our chip's one of the one of the one of the more recent chips. It's not the most recent chip. There's there's others that are in that category. Okay.
Um, so we do have a, uh, let's see, yeah. All right, so you know that we've been over the syntax. I'm not gonna have you write any code, so I'm not gonna really talk about this. So we'll skip through this. And then you, you should know that we have our byte-oriented instructions. You should know and remember that the lower seven bits of the 12-bit address are in these instructions itself. Of course, here where it refers to the W register, there's no reason for an, uh, for a, a, uh, an address. Um, so here are the different uh, here are the different instructions, uh, and these are the byte-oriented instructions. Then we have uh, these two byte-oriented skip, uh, the decrement f skip on zero and increment f skip on zero, and then we have uh, the the bit-oriented uh, bit bit clear f bit set f and then bit test f skip set bit test f skip clear or I switched them but bit test f skip clear bit test f skip set again lower seven bits are of the address are in the instruction and then we have a little three bit field to tell us which bit we're dealing with whereas up here uh, in these byte oriented instructions uh, we have a single bit called the d bit and you can see the d bits right there the d bits right there here, there's no D bit, and that's the move W to F. Here, there's no D bit, that's the clear W, and here, there's no D bit, that's clear F. But other than that, they all have a D bit, as do the, as do these. They also have a D bit. That tells you where you're going to leave the result of the operation. In this case, it's you decrement F. Where do you store those results? If you don't, uh, if you don't specify, they go in the file register, which is what you want with these instructions. But in many cases, with these other instructions, if you don't specify it, uh, then it leaves it in W, which might not be what you are. Sorry, leaves it in the file register, which may not be what you want, especially when you're trying to move it to the file register. All right, um, and then we have uh, these literal operations. Uh, the ones that deal with W have an 8-bit literal, and that includes add a literal to W and the literal with W, inclusive or a literal with W, ex subtract a literal from W, and exclusive or a little literal with W. The other ones uh, of which there's, uh, and move a literal to W. Then there's two others, and I didn't include, yeah, inclusive or, ex exclusive or. The two others are move a literal to the bank select register, and that literal is only five bits. Move a literal to the PC latch high, and that literal is only seven bits. But all the other literals are eight bits. And yeah, okay, that's good. That was good, right? Yeah. Then we have some of these control operations. Branch always, branch relative to W, call a subroutine, call a subroutine with W, go to a, an address, uh, return from interrupt enable, uh, return with a literal in W from a subroutine, and just return from a subroutine. And then there's finally these uh, inherent things. We don't really use these much except for reset, sleep, uh, no operation, clear the watchdog timer. Uh, the, the option in TRIS we don't really use anymore. Um, and then there's a few C compiler ones. Uh, MOVIW and MOVWI. All right. Now, uh, we're not going to talk about indirect addressing, but, it, but if you do specify an indirect address in assembly language, you just, you just specify the file select register or zero or one, and you have to have preloaded uh, those registers. Um, so you can also do pre and post auto incrementing, and you can uh, you can use these indirect addressing to to address the entire one uh, one kilohertz of memory, one k of memory as a continuous block. These are this this is the only kind of addressing that the C compiler does. Everything on the and C is done using indirect addressing. Uh, and again, I'm not going to really go through that. Um, okay, I think I've talked about all this. Um, so there, there are some uh, configuration words. You should know some of these things. You should know that we always pick the internal oscillator for our oscillator selection, that we have classically picked the watchdog timer off, but uh, for the next lab, we're going we're gonna to make it software enableable. And then uh, we usually do the power up timer off, master clear on, code protect, uh, program protect, yeah, code protect program and code protect data both off. 
and then brown out, reset. You can have it or not. It doesn't really matter because we probably won't brown out. Well, you could with your battery, I guess. Clock out, enable, off, in, in, internal, external, switch over, off, fail safe, clock monitor, uh, off, and then uh, flash memory self write protection, off, face lock loop, off, uh, stack underflow, overflow, reset, enable, that can be on, and brown out voltage, uh, usually low voltage, uh, I forget what that is. And then finally, low voltage programming, on. If you're gonna use your snap, that has to be set on. If you, you can turn it off one time with your snap, but then you wouldn't be able to turn it back on because now your snap won't work. You have to get a different programmer and turn that bit back on, and then you can use your snap again. Um, okay. So I pretty well went over the configuration bits. Um, so uh, when we used the Picket 3, we didn't use low voltage programming but with the snap, we do use it all the time. And this was kind of a legacy thing. Uh, you know, it's kind of not true anymore, but it used to be true that it was better to turn it off. Uh, there was kind of a funny reason, but it's kind of gone now. And so now you should probably just always leave it on. Okay. Um, so the oscillator mode, we use the internal oscillator, uh, but you could have it set up with all sorts of other features. You can have an external crystal, external RC network. You can have... Uh, you can turn on the phase lock loop to get to a couple of higher speeds, like the 32 uh, megahertz clock, if you want want that. With For 4 megahertz, you don't need the phase lock loop, so we just leave it off. If it's off in the configuration word, you can always turn it on in software. If it's on in the configuration word, you can't really turn it off. Um, and here are the various choices for the oscillator module. We use the internal oscillator. Um, the PI, the PIC is a fully static uh, chip, which means you can when you you can stop the clock and step through everything uh, in a single cycle, and you don't lose any data. Now, having said that, sometimes some things like A to D conversions and some other stuff gets screwed up. Um, so there's there's some I think a few little issues with that, but in general, yeah, that's that's exactly right. It works fine. Um, so the uh, so the oscillator start, startup timer uh, counts up on reset or power up uh, before ac program execution begins just to ensure clock stability. But you can you can deactivate that. Uh, 2P, the, there's other functions. I, I don't think I'm going to go through these because some of them I'm, I'm not going to test you on. All right. So the multiple the multiple modes give you a lot of different uh, clock options and that's very important for lots of embedded applications some embedded applications you want all your processors running on the same clock so you'll you'll generate a clock on a on a printed circuit board and, with some clock chip maybe and then you'll distribute it around the board to the various processors so so, so that everything's uh, synchronized um, on the other hand if you want to go cheap you can generate a fairly accurate clock inside I think we looked at that clock on the oscilloscope and saw that it was it was within a, a just a cycle or two of what it was supposed to be. Um, okay, um, so almost all software these days is developed in these large integrated development environments, um, and they do have sort of a learning curve to them. But and they're have lots of features they're fairly complex but once you begin to learn the features and you've used them and gotten some experience they really do make your life a whole lot easier and and there's lots of features that are helpful in this um, oh, let's see I think we talked about the rest of the stuff um, you should uh, make sure you know uh, what the steps are in setting up a new project um, you should know that you you need to let the IDE uh, basically, create your directory structure by use, by right-clicking on your sources and right-clicking on your uh, header files, and then either either creating those and then pasting into them, or or, or you can you can uh, you can include them, but it, uh, you just have to make sure that the that when those files are there, you can't just paste them in uh, in, uh, uh, in 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 through using the Windows software, you really do have to go through the IDE, otherwise they kind of get lost. Um, all right. Uh, I'm not going to go through this. I think we've talked about most of this stuff. Um, the block diagram looks like this. I just have a few more things to say. Um, 
So I want to talk a little bit about, um, so here's our, here's our module. Notice we have our program flash memory here has its own bus and address, data bus and address bus, 14 bit wide. This is an 8 bit bus, 8 bit data bus. The address bus over here ha it can, has 12 bits. The address bus here has 15 bits. And here's your clock module and your master clear pin. All right, so uh, on, your, on this, we have all of our uh, ports. We do have 256 bytes of uh, EEPROM that you can use to store non-volatile data as opposed to your flash memory that's also non-volatile, but that's for your program. Uh, here you have uh, port A, port B, and port C. So you have essentially, uh, these work out to be a, a roughly 18 uh, GPIO pins, but of course, we don't use master clear, we don't use RA0 and 1 because we were using those with our debug header. So we basically have power ground minus 3, so we, we're missing 5 pins of the 20, so we have about 15 uh, pins in our ports we can use. There are a total of uh, 6 pins in port A, 4 pins in port B, and uh, 8 pins in port C available, although some of those are taken up uh, with, our, with the things we just mentioned, uh, particularly our programming header. Uh, then we have all these modules, timers, uh, A to C, D to A, comparators, uh, UR, our, our, our master synchronous serial port, which includes SPI and I2C, our, uh, our, our capture compare and uh, PWM modules. We have two enhance, which give us a, a, a full H bridge and a half an H bridge, and then these two don't have the H bridges. Um, and then we have SR latches, and we've got a bunch of other things that aren't mentioned here, like touch sensing module and a number of other things. Okay, just a few more things, and we'll finish. So our A to D, you should know something about the general concept of its successive approximation register method. It uses a sampling capacitor that's fairly low value. I think it's uh, uh, 14 uh, uh, picofarads, uh, 15 picofarads or something like that, and it's connected and it follows the the output the, it follows the external channel you're trying to convert then when you start the conversion it's disconnected from the channel it and and it's connected to very high impedance uh, uh, comparator and the comparator then compares what's in the SAR register to what's in the uh, what's in the capacitor and uh, and it it sets the highest order bit if it's higher uh, then it clears it sets the next bit if it's lower then it uh, keeps the bit set and goes to the next bit and it steps through all uh, 10 bits and the last bit then it sets or clears depending and then your final result is available plus or minus one bit. Um, you can left or right justify the result. Uh, for C use we almost always right justify it. In assembly sometimes we'll left justify it and throw away the lower two bits. Uh, you have to set up a clock that gives it about a one megahertz clock. That'll give you the optimum performance. Uh, you could choose what voltages. We, we usually just go from the, gr the chip ground to the chip uh, voltage, which would be VDD. Uh, so VSS to VDD. But you can use external pins. What you cannot do is you can never go below ground and you can never go above the operating voltage of the chip. So if you're running the chip at 3.3, that is the maximum input voltage you can use. If you're running the chip at 5 volts, then you can go all the way up to 5. You can never go below 0. You can, if you want, uh, raise the zero up a little bit uh, and you can do that with an external pin uh, and then you could go between those uh, voltages like you could set it at one volt and you could have you could be running at 3.3 volts so you would be basically running from one volt as your low to 3.3 as your high. Uh, sometimes uh, that is useful but sometimes we'll just have to put in, take some external circuitry and interface a uh, a operational amplifier and use that to condition our signal to DC shift it uh, so that it's uh, so that it's all above zero, and to uh, maybe amplify or attenuate it so it fills up our available uh, voltage range uh, fairly nicely and gives us the best resolution. You should keep in mind um, that it is a 10-bit A to D converter. Uh, you should kind of know that uh, that it takes about 13 cycles at uh, a megahertz, so at least 13 or 14 microseconds to do the conversion, and we have to follow Nyquist's criteria. We have, to, we have to sample it twice the bandwidth or twice the highest frequency component. Um, 
we do have 12 channels and they are uh, well 12 external channels and there's three internal channels and there's an analog multiplexer that selects between these uh, these 15 different available channels you should know some uses for A to D it's a good way to read in say a temperature sensor it's a good way to read in a pot so you can uh, do a setting remotely it's a good way to do uh, it's a good way to to read in uh, a signal that's changing modestly uh, maybe a maybe a low bandwidth audio signal, or maybe uh, maybe you're just uh, uh, f following something else, uh, like a like a soil water uh, so soil water uh, sensor, or maybe uh, an altimeter, or maybe you're following um, uh, a D maybe a D to A or what or well maybe following a, a temperature or uh, just a whole bunch of things. Um, Timer module. You should know that we use the timer module for various things. We use it to generate a delay in our blink routine. We also use it to create an interrupt and also at the same time do the delay. We also use it uh, in our touch sensing module to give us a fixed time base and also to count how many oscillations we had in that fixed time base. We use timer zero for the fixed time base. We use timer one to count how many oscillations uh, over that fixed time base. So what the frequency actually was uh, at whether it was touched or untouched, we just used a, used a threshold, and if it uh, and if if it was um, uh, if it dropped below the threshold, we knew that it had been touched because that would increase the capacitance, and the capacitance would slow down the RC timer. Um, and then interrupts. You should know that all interrupts jump to location four. Uh, this is this is a fixed vector setup. So uh, many many microprocessors have. Uh, a vector table so every every separate interrupt goes to a specific location in memory and that's where you put your interrupt service routine so that's a very nice feature then you don't have you know exactly why you're there you're there to service that interrupt and you don't have to check around to see which of several interrupts it might have been uh, with our method you would have to check that although on the problem we did we only had one source of interrupt so it wasn't too difficult we never turned anything else on so we just had to verify yep that's what it is and then we were good and if not then we were going to reset um, we save the return address on the stack and then we have these shadow registers that save a whole bunch of the registers that we might use so we don't have to s specifically uh, spend time in our interrupt routine saving them so we can use them like for instance the W register a good chance you'll use the W register in your interrupt routine this is automatically pushed into a shadow W register that saves the context so it can be restored when we return um, uh, you cannot send an, a, a value to an interrupt routine, and an interrupt routine can't return a value. But you could, of course, use global variables and uh, and modify variables in that in that method. Um, we typically want to reset uh, after we finish doing our interrupt, uh, and we want to fellow. Uh, we want to uh, we want to talk about some of the uses for interrupts. Usually, it's a good way. To service rare events, or uh, high-speed events, or frequent events, and still be able to get some other things done with our CPU at the same time. Touch sensing. You should know uh, that there's a bunch of modalities. Ours uses capacitive changes, uh, but there's inductive changes, uh, temperature, uh, all sorts of stuff has been used, and there are a lot of problems with uh, a lot of problems with some of these concepts. And that's one of the reasons why Microchip has abandoned the touch sensing module on our chip. They don't, they don't include it anymore because it does have a little problem. Uh, if there's a certain frequency of noise in the uh, environment uh, near where, the, where this is working, then it's going to really cause problems with the touch sensing module that are very, very difficult to fix or maybe impossible. This, this sensing module has a fixed time base, an analog multiplexer, uh, and you can see a change in your... Uh, in your uh, RC oscillator that's formed with the touch sensing module and your touch sensing pad. When your finger goes on it, the capacitance goes up, the oscillator, uh, RC oscillator then goes down and, and you, you weaken in a very small, uh, one of the, well, you, you, you perceive these, these changes. They're not necessarily small. Uh, they, it can actually create a pretty big change in the oscillator frequency. And that's what you detect sending a threshold. When it drops below the threshold, you've detected a touch. There's some weaknesses. Noise is a big one. Um, the current trend in the PICs, uh, they're using what's called a charge time measurement unit, 
which uses a constant current source and the A to D converter. Usually it's a calculating A to D converter, a little more fancy one than the one we have on this chip. All right, so that's pretty much all I wanted to do. Uh, I think we'll stop with that and uh, we will, uh, you'll have the test then on Friday. And I think with that, we will stop. Let me pull up my old face again. All right, so, uh, so hopefully that's helpful to give you a little bit of a review for uh, what you're going to need to need to know.